Okay, so we have now been through two chapters and hopefully this will, you'll be able to hear all of this. So, um, okay, so we, we talked a lot about the Greeks last time. Before that, probably the, the biggest civilization that we dealt with singularly was the Egyptians in chapter one. And chapter three, we're, we're not really, we are dealing with a civilization, but we're more dealing with an empire than a civilization. It's, it's not the, um, it's not that they're, they are a unified civilization the way that the Egyptians were. For instance, with the Egyptians, everybody spoke Egyptian, everybody wrote, you know, who, who could write, wrote, you know, in, in the hieroglyphics, but they all, you know, followed Pharaoh and they all believed that Pharaoh was incarnate, at least pretty much. Not that it could encapsulate everyone. Obviously, people had differences of opinion, but, but Romans are different because Romans were more of a government more of a, a system of governance. And they imposed this with the help of the Roman army on many different civilizations, including the Egyptian civilization and the Greek city-states. So the truth is, is the Romans kind of covered all of these areas. And in fact, they're going to cover a lot of different faiths, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different modes of dress, a lot of different, you know, moral outlooks and, and, you know, ideas about the, you know, the spiritual, and they're going to pretty much say, look, whatever you want to believe, you can believe, and you can be, and we're all good with that, as long as it does not interfere with us and the governance of the empire. Now, Rome, I'm going to show you kind of where Rome is. If you look kind of midway down the darkest, well, all the way down the darkest green part of this map, you're going to see Rome. And the truth is, is there were a lot of different semi-nomadic or fully nomadic tribes at this time. And these different nomadic tribes began to settle along several different rivers and things like that. Now, Rome is a little in distinct in that it, it is settled along, not a huge river, but at least a river, but it was not on the coast. So a lot of the the city states in Greece, for instance, are coastal. They can within, you know, half a day's walk or or even less, you can get into a boat and you can float wherever you want to. And primarily because of the mountain system that was inherent in the Greek Isles, primarily the Greeks traded overseas. They traded throughout the Mediterranean Sea and the Adriatic Sea. And yet, for the Romans, a lot of their trade was going to end up, of course, go, having to go over land, though they did have a navy, but they would encapsulate an entire group of, um, oh, an entire, well, pretty much all of the Mediterranean area and all of the land surrounding it. And that went, and plus quite a bit north, you know, they went into much, pretty much took up much of France, part of, of what is now Germany, and they even took over the, the, the British Isles, even though that was by far the farthest away geographically from what they were, what they had accomplished. And of course, this was done over time. And over the centuries, the, the Roman Empire became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until honestly, it was really too big. And by the end of the lecture, we're going to get to the point where you understand that that's one of the factors that led to the fall of Rome. And it's the end of the Roman Empire. Now, when did this start? Um, honestly, you know, only a, a little over a century before the Common Era. So maybe as much as 250 years, depending on how people view it, to all the way through until about, well, the mid fifth century, late fifth century of the Common Era. So it was probably, it's not exactly, you know, it's not like they lasted for thousands and thousands of years. But what they did do, they did well. And we're going to talk about all of those things. So of all of these different tribes, a number of them had different um, artisanal kind of abilities, you know, with pottery or with other aspects of art, or creation of mosaics, with painting, or with music, or, you know, those types of things, or with technological concepts, you know, with building. And so what Romans did 
and what the Roman Empire would do is it would take the best, it would take the, the skills of all of these different areas and it would use them in useful ways to further the Roman Empire. And that's probably what it did best. It, it kind of took the best of all of the cultures that it amassed and made stuff that was extremely practical and yet also beautiful, but more than anything else, it was practical. That's the big thing. That's the word of the Roman Empire. With the Greeks, their art and their architecture above all was meant to be pleasing. So they were looking for ideal forms, ideal proportions. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cough. And the Romans were not so worried about ideal, like the ideal of something or the ideal, you know, they were looking for size. So their, their structures were much bigger than most of the Greek structures. And they were looking at practicality. What can we use to make it so that we can get faster from one place to another. They were the first to build roads that had any sort of permanence. And in fact, some of their roads are still in use today, though they're pretty much covered up by tar and stuff like that to make modern roads, but they're still there. And they actually became some of the source maps for what is pretty much the road structure we use today. But they also have structures that are still in use today, as we're gonna see. So, um, and they were the first to really use the technology of concrete. And in fact, their concrete is better and is more, it lasts longer than the concrete that we use today. So there's a lot that's gonna change and a lot of this, but it, you know, much of what they did still survives. And probably the, the what is probably the most helpful part of it too is, is, and something that will have lasting effects throughout many of the future cultures is the language of Latin. So remember the Greeks use Greek, and we still, we'll talk about actually the difference between when we get to religions, <coughs> I'm still not doing this. Um, when we get to religions, we're gonna talk about Christianity. And once Christianity became established, it very quickly split into two groups. One will be based on the Latin Bible and one will be based on the Greek Bible. And they're, they're pretty much the same books, but the language is what separates the two. So we're gonna talk about a lot of that, those elements as we go through, but hopefully this will give you kind of a background on how Rome slowly formed and what how they saw their identity and what they did with different cultures that they took over. So a lot of what we're gonna do in this chapter two is compare the Romans to the Greeks. Remember the Greeks were very disconnected um, city-states. They were geographically connected, but they often warred with each other. They often attacked each other and they each governed themselves. And so they didn't have any unifying government. The opposite is true of Rome. Their whole purpose was to unify all of their countries enough, you know, all those different places that they'd taken over so that they could work as one institution, one empire. Even if the people of those different areas still spoke their own language, worshiped their own gods, and did things their own way. The structure of the government united them all, kind of like our overarching federal government. That's kind of really the system. So it's as if, you know, with the Greeks, it was as if we had a bunch of states, but with no federal government. In this case though, the federal government is very strong in the Roman empire. It's stronger than any of the other, gov uh, any, any of, the, of the other governing systems. And if some of those governing systems try to take power, they are very quickly squelched because by the Roman military of all you know groups, and and they are kept if they want to, they can be kept by you know choice, or they be, can be kept part of the empire by force. And Rome was not afraid of using that. And we'll probably talk about that a little bit, especially when we get to Christianity as well. Mainly because it will have an effect on Judea and and the area of the region of Judah, uh, because that's where the Jews are, and they were not happily part of Rome. Now, what, what was happily part of Rome or what did figure in a lot with Roman Empire were the Greek tales of epic heroes and the Trojan War. Most Romans, especially once the, the, the Rome became established and it, the Roman Empire became established, most Romans saw themselves as the descendants of Trojans, not Greeks. And in fact, they would develop one of the poets, Virgil, would develop a story about one Trojan, Aeneas, 
and how he somehow escaped from the Trojan War when the slaughter started happening and the Greeks started, you know, after the Trojan horse that we talked about last time. Um, he actually would develop the story about this guy Aeneas who would end up going to Carthage in, in, in Egypt, which was part of the Roman Empire by this time, and then eventually went to Rome and founded Rome. But there's another founding Rome story, and that is of Romulus and Remus. Romulus, of course, is what Rome would be named after. And they, they were twin sons of Mars, although Mars is the Roman version of the Greek god Ares, the god of war. Now we know, I don't know if you guys do, but I mean, I know that in general people know the Roman god names much better because those are the planets, for instance. And, you know, when, when you have Mercury and Venus and, you know, those are all Roman names, then we tend to know those better. Probably because, of course, the Romans took over the Greeks. And so they, what they did is instead of, you know, inventing their own system of gods that was also polytheistic, they took the Greek ones and just changed the names. And there are, there, I think there are a couple of, of Greek gods, first of all, that don't have their names changed. Apollo's name did not change from one place to the other. And there were a few that were invented on top of it. But most of the the gods in the Greek pantheon are have equivalent, you know, gods in the in the Roman one. But the Romans didn't exactly take them as seriously. So the stories are more fun stories than people who really devoutly worship the gods the way that the Greeks had done where they would, you know, build temples just for a particular God and actually, you know, bring gifts and really fervently, you know, sacrifice cattle and stuff like that. That that didn't happen as much in Rome. They were a far less religious society in general. That's probably why they were more accepting of other cultures having other religions. They didn't care. It didn't bother them at all. But in, in the story of Romulus and Remus, which is, of course, based on, you know, the same type of patterns that are in Greek mythology. Romulus and Remus are twin sons of Mars by a human woman. So it's not a goddess. They're half, you know, demigods, if you want to think about it in, in that term. They were abandoned because, of course, Mars wasn't supposed to be with a girl. And she had, a, had these children out of wedlock. Well, so they were abandoned. They were found by a wolf and nursed to health. And because of... I guess the milk from the wolf, they were, it's almost like, I guess, Tarzan. That's probably as close as we get. They're, they're stronger, they're faster, they're more capable. They have almost magical properties, you know, to be heroes. And eventually, unfortunately, and not, not so much, you know, it's, it's not a, a hor considered to be a horrible story, but Remus, Romulus eventually kills Remus. And then Romulus feels bad about it and everything, but he, he wanders off and he eventually founds Rome and names it after himself, Romulus. Now, what's funny, and I don't know, though, for those of you who have read the, the Old Testament, especially the first few chapters of the Old Testament, uh, this is a very similar tale in some ways. It doesn't have quite the similarity, but it's two brothers and one of them kills the other. So it's, it's a lot like the Cain and Abel story. And there are, you know, it's kind of, it depends on where, where the origins come from. Again, a lot of this is word of mouth before it was written down. But there are questions about, you know, how much were the brothers jealous of each other? How much did, you know, did they compete? And would they, would Romulus have been as heroic or strong or been able to defend Rome if he didn't have Remus dead? And so there's, there's still those, kind of, a lot of archaeologists have found that, that things questionable. So just there are parallels in there. I just wanted you to be aware of that. But either one was seen as a story that really, you know, it added to the grandeur of Rome be, by linking it to epic Greek mythology and to the gods. And so even if most people didn't believe any of it was true, they liked the stories. Now, Rome is actually, you see, it's on, you can see that it's going through the, the Tiber River is actually going right through Rome. And then it's also built along a hill. When I went to Rome, you could see the Vatican, which is still, it's actually its own city inside Rome. It's kind of like if you ever, if you're living in Valdosta, there's a, Remerton is inside Valdosta. It's a little bitty town inside of a much larger city. 
Well, that's kind of the way the Vatican is. It is its own gover self-governed city. And the Vatic Vatican City is the, the house of essentially the, the center of the Roman Holy, Holy Roman Catholic Church or the center of Catholicism. And so you, but from one of the hills, I, I stayed actually in a hotel up on one of the hills. And so you could see the, the Dome of St. Peter, which we'll talk about in chapter 10, but you could see a lot of the, of some of the old Rome. You can't see the Colosseum from where I was, but um, much of the old part of, of um, Rome is in that central part, that field of Mars. And so it's between the river and the hills of Rome. So, um, but it's, it, what's interesting though, is it's not a coastal city. So a lot of trade, I mean, would be have been done through waterways. So it would either have to come up on the Tiber or it would have to um, come over land. What's good about this though, is because it has hills all on one side, it was much easier to, to defend than many other cities would have been. And so they, there is no like, there's no wall around it the way that, for instance, we had walls in in Mycenae and and in um, some of the early Greek cultures. You know, a lot of those had built walls around the city to defend it. Rome didn't have to do that because the river was on one side as a defense, and the hills were on the other side as a defense. So it was much easier. But Rome was also very innovative when it came to technologies, and. Roman culture was unlike many others and I mean they lived in a pretty warm climate but Rome's definite Romans definitely believed in bathing and so in Rome proper they had what were called essentially they were continuously flushing toilets so you would you would have a regular toilet looking so, sort of seat with a hole in it and there, but the water was continually rushing underneath and so there was never any what's the word there was never any um, waste that would, everything was always, you know, clean and it smelled better. It was probably one of the better smelling cities in the ancient world, because even though there were millions of people eventually who would live here, they had water coming, fresh water coming in through aqueducts. They had um, public baths. Many Roman, most Romans took a bath every day. And many of them took a bath several times a day. A lot of business was conducted in the in the public bathhouses. And even today, you can go walk all around Rome and there are water fountains everywhere. And you can just literally turn on the water fountain and get a drink and it tastes absolutely delicious. And they pride themselves on that. And that's from, I mean, literally, these are things that they did and they had 2,000 plus years ago. And they're still part of Roman society and Roman culture. So the, definitely there was a lot of, uh, they were using these technological advances to essentially transport w water to places where people needed it so that populated areas could have enough water, not only for drinking, but for bathing and for flushing toilets. But they also, you know, use the technological advances to build larger structures and more permanent structures for people, not only to house people in them, but to accommodate crowds in a coliseum or on a, in a theater or to make it so that they could do essentially have chariot races and so there, there's a lot of what they did was for entertainment value as well but it was all meant to make the quality of life for the romans better and so it, but it was all pretty practical too you know many people would say oh let's paint something pretty on the wall it, they're inventing toilets that flush continuously in the end, what would I rather have? A plain wall and a flushing toilet. So I, I appreciate the practicality of Rome. But um, now early structures, we don't really have a lot of surviving structures that were made early, mostly because they were, if they were made out of concrete, it was inferior and it, it often caved. It was also often built with flat roofs and, and concrete doesn't do really well without re reinforcement in a flat roof. And so the ones that survive today are usually ones that have either a domed top or they had a wooden roof that would that have been continuously replaced because the wooden wood would have been far lighter material to use, but wood does not last. And that's really, you know, some of you have already asked about cu cultures that, you know, aren't talked about at this point. And the truth is, is a lot of these old, the older cultures at this time were still nomadic. And other ones, if they built structures, they were all made out of wood 
or leather or something else that was going to over time degrade to the point where it was gone. And so we, what we have essentially what we're looking at is the, the most permanent civilizations from their earliest time until now. And so Rome was definitely one of those who's, you know, even these ancient buildings for a lot of the Greek isles, those ancient buildings like the Parthenon are in ruins. In Rome, many of, there are a lot of ruins, especially like in the Roman Forum, but there are a lot of structures too, that, as we will see that survive in pristine condition even today. Now for Rome, Rome was automatically a republic. Now we know of a direct democracy that, that was happening in Athens, of course, where all the, the men who were over a certain age who owned land and were Amer Athenian citizens could vote. And they would go directly over to vote whenever they needed to vote on something. In Rome, there was never a time when they would, when everybody in the Roman Republic could have voted. First of all, it's just too big. Instead, they had essentially a Senate that of representatives, people who were supposed to, well, most of them weren't that elected. You know, they were um, they were descendants of the first 100 senators of Rome. So essentially, the first most richest, most influential people when Rome was founded, their descendants. Um, ran the Senate. They weren't really elected, but they were supposed to represent the population at large. They were supposed to. It's rather like we don't have something, we have senators, of course, but our senators are elected. But in, for instance, in England, even today, although they have far less power than they used to, the English British Parliament used to be only a House of Lords. So the Parliament was essentially very, very wealthy people who inherited their role in parliament from their fathers. And so you just, you know, when your father stepped down or died, then you would take it over as a guy. And there were no women, of course, um, and they were not elected. Now, today, I mean, very early, actually back in the late medieval period, the parliament be was made into two houses in the UK the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Those are just common people. Well, those people were elected. They had to actually go through an election and be elected to power, but they had very little power at the beginning. Now today, the House of Lords does not have nearly the same power that the House of Commons has. Those are still inherited seats, even today, but they don't have the same um, abilities. They're, that That house cannot do cannot enact laws the way that the House of Commons can. So although people still do attend and still inherit their seats. In this case, that's exactly what it was though, is those patricians were the equivalent of the House of Lords. They all descended, it, it wasn't so much that they were elected, but plebeians were essentially like the people with a little bit of land. They didn't have the big, they weren't the big super rich people, they were the eh, rich people with land. and. People who couldn't, essentially, who didn't have land couldn't vote. Same thing as with, remember, with Athens. If you didn't own land, even if you were a male citizen, you couldn't vote. And so, the, you know, again, the vast majority of male citizens could not vote. And most of the Roman Empire was not deemed to be made of Roman citizens. Although when we get to Julius Caesar, he actually opened it up so that people from all over the empire could become Roman citizens, but that also gave them the right to vote. And so a lot of the, the patricians weren't so happy about that because they didn't, you know, the more people vote, the less power they have. And that's not what they wanted. But the truth is, is it was still a republic where certain people are in government and they are supposed to represent the rest of the population. And the truth is, is it got bigger and bigger as it went along. So you'll notice in the Pyrrhic Wars, Rome took over Greece in 280 to 275 BCE. And then in the Punic Wars, they took over Carthage in 264 to 146. And that's where, that's of course part of Egypt. And they would end up taking over much of the Egyptian, you know, at least the, the top half of Egypt and making it part of, of the Roman Republic. But they would amass even more as we went along. And so that, that Roman Republic gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as the years go by, mostly through the efforts of the Roman army. 
the Roman army was pretty much, it, it helped maintain control. It helped establish a very, you know, systemized form of government all the way throughout, you know, the, the Roman soldiers were also a commodity. So when different groups were taken over by the Roman Empire, either by force or willingly, um, they would, the expectation is that Rome, the center of the empire, would ask of them tribute. So they want they were they wanted them to send money, would ask for slaves so that they had more, you know, of a labor force that, you know, was pretty much unpaid and would ask for soldiers. So they they didn't really draft soldiers, but they would essentially say, okay, you got this many people, you need to send us men who can fight. Those men would be shipped to Rome to be trained. The Roman, the, this Roman army would become very united in a lot of ways. It was, they were very well trained. They were far better, at least for most of the centuries of the Roman Empire, they were far better fighters and you know better trained than most of the other fighters they would face. So they made Rome largely very successful militarily. They also were the origin of much of the Caesars that would end up you know, being emperor. So, and, and this probably started with Julius Caesar as really the first, we, we did have three leaders at the end of um, the, with the first triumvirate. Um, and that was three big, big wigs, I guess you can say. There's Julius Caesar, who was a general in the army. So he was not a senator and he was not a patrician, though he was upper class. And then Pompey and Crassus. Very quickly, the first triumvirate kind of fell apart. Um, Pompey was a, was an ally of the Senate. Caesar Julius Caesar was not okay, and and the Senate was a little wary of Julius Caesar's popularity because he was a general and because he had a lot of control of the over the military, and but the people themselves he was a very popular um, general. He was a very popular leader. People liked him. He was a, from what I can understand, from what I can tell, he was a very likable guy in general. But he wanted. He also, because of his popularity, that gave him power. And the Senate didn't want him to have that power. Well, Pompey was much more of an ally with the Senate. And so when Caesar was coming triumphantly because of, you know, he was, he was a very good general, they were coming back from battle triumphant. And normally they would parade through the city with, you know, brass fanfare and everything. And the Senate would come and, you know, cheer them on and whatever. Well, Pompey essentially said, you know, you better be careful because Caesar's coming in and he may use his army and take over everything. So the Senate demanded Caesar to leave his army on the other side of the river. Caesar only had a, you know, he he took almost all of it. He, he disobeyed orders, took his, it, probably smartly, because had he gone by himself, goodness knows what would have happened. We know what happened later. Um, so, well, 15 years later, but he refused. So he crossed over the Rubicon with his army. And that was seen as tre treason, at least by a lot of people. And then when Pompey let, you know, the Senate it urged Pompey to go and meet him in battle, um, Caesar met Pompey and their armies clashed. Caesar's army was much smaller, and yet he 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 defeated Pompey, and Pompey was killed. So that made the end of that. Then Caesar essentially comes. I mean, the people, of course, love him. They think he's fantastic. And so, you know, what's the big deal? They didn't like Pompey anyway, and he kind of takes over. Now, for a while, he serves along with the, alongside the Senate, but he enacts several laws. He's the one who, for instance, allows plebeians to create a plebeian council and gives them more rights. He does a lot of things, you know, within Rome that make people happy. You know, he, he builds some things and um, he, he just makes some choices that are very popular choices with the people, but they take power away from the Senate and give it to commoners and the Senate doesn't like it. Remember, they're the patricians. They're the way up high people. And so eventually Caesar is, he, he claims to have been urged to, and it's the history books are a little iffy on it. We're not sure, you know, they're more in praise of him than they are of the Senate, but Caesar takes the title dictator for life, which essentially makes him a king. They haven't had one up to this point. 
And once he does that, they're not, re- you know, the Senate's not really happy about it, but they invite him. The Senate says, why don't you come and meet us at the Senate, and, you know, in the forum? He said, he thinks, hey, that means they're going to proclaim me emperor. He walks down, goes to the Senate, and the Senate, eight senators stab him to death. And he is assassinated on the Ides of March, on March 15th. And um, that he has no, he does have an heir, but it's not legitimate. So his wife, his wife is Calpurnia, but she does not have any children. But he actually has a child by Cleopatra, the queen of Egypt. The, you know, she's essentially the pharaoh. And, um, but, but he's not legitimate because Caesar's not married to her. And so he's not an, a viable alternative. And so there's nothing to be done. I mean, he he has no successor. Because of that, we have what is called the second triumvirate. Um, and that second triumvirate has Mark Antony or Marcus Antonius in the Latin and Lepidus. And they are the essentially Augustus Caesar, that is the nephew. Well, he's his name's just Augustus at first. Um, but well, it's actually Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, but he makes himself Augustus, which means venerable or majestic. But um, essentially, Augustus, Mark, Mark Antony, and Lepidus all make the second triumvirate, which is just as successful as the first in that it falls apart almost immediately. And pretty much Julius Caesar's nephew wants all the power. And so um, he makes that very clear. And uh, Mark Antony really wanted Caesar's death to be, you know, is, is the, the murderers to be caught and killed. And Mark Antony actually did a pretty good job of that. Um, just a second. But then because of that, because, you know, it, even though Mark Antony is ob- was obviously an ally of Caesar's, it doesn't make, all it does is make him more powerful. And that's a threat to um, Augustus Caesar. So what Augustus does, or Caesar Augustus, honestly, they were interchangeable in Latin. You could put words in any order and they meant the same thing. But Caesar, Augustus Caesar, takes the throne. Mark Antony realizes, oh, wait a minute. I'm in trouble, and this is not going to work as a tri- as a triumvirate, and I better get out of here. And he does. He actually flees with Cleopatra. They married and had like four kids or something. And so he's gone to Egypt, but that's not far enough because that's still within the, the realm um, of the Roman Empire. Remember, that's still part of the Roman Empire. And so essentially, Augustus Caesar sends his troops to go and track them down and kill them because he doesn't want them to come back and go, remember, Cleopatra has um, Julius Caesar's only child, the only kid he has. Even if he's out of wedlock, he, he's the only, his name is Octavian. I mean, it, it's, um, no, it's Caesarian, like the Caesarian section. But Cleopatra and, Antonia and, and Mark Antony eventually cannot escape and they both commit suicide and um there's a really good play shakespearean play actually about julius caesar and it's called julius caesar and there's a really good play about um mark antony and cleopatra and it's called antony and cleopatra both both by shakespeare but they cover it pretty well but they're they cover it based on the history books because a lot of historians at this time were writing down all of that history it's practical stuff you know they, that's what the romans thought and they really thought it was important to track all this stuff down so then at that point once cleopatra and mark antony both die cleopatra famously gets bitten by her little asps and they poison her to death and mark antony famously um falls on his sword which is the roman way of committing suicide especially roman soldiers they like to you know and Caesar, then Octavius Caesar becomes Caesar Caesar. He becomes the, the, the emperor of, over all of it. And he names himself Augustus because he's just venerable. It's funny too, because there are tons of, of relief sculptures and other sculptures of um, Octavianus, of 
Augustus Caesar. And he, even the ones that were made after his death are all of him as a young man. So we, we really don't know what he really looked like. Some of the, the sculptures, as we'll see later on, of Julius Caesar are actually quite um, realistic looking. He had, actually had a pretty long face. And I think, let me look at the chapter and see if I can show you this. Um, but they had a, they're, he's not the most attractive guy. Let me put it that way. Um, if I can just go a little faster, that would be great. Um, this is actually pretty, that's pretty normal. That he has a long nose, very thin face. And there are further sculptures of him. And I think I put one in here. Let me see if it's in here. Um, showing him kind of as he really, maybe I didn't. But he, he there's a, a famous green sculpture of him with yellow eyes and he has a super long nose and he's really, he's not an attractive man. But he was extremely popular, so who cares if he was attractive? I guess we could we could look at it that way. But for I guess for Augustus Caesar, it was very important that he be shown as really big and brawny and young and virile and all that stuff, even when he was really old or even dead. So um, he it mattered to him. And the truth is, is after that, you know, once he became Caesar, he he ruled for quite a long time, and his rule was. A calm one. This is where we call what where we began. What what's called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, because the 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 Caesars that come after this, at least for a while, live pretty long terms. They are you know relatively little, you know military militarily to do. They don't have any big wars. It's pretty calm for quite some time after um, Augustus Caesar takes over, and it gives him time too to foster the arts, to build a lot of the structures that, that end up populating much of what is today old Rome, but was part of the city. Um, definitely the, you know, he commissioned a lot of, you know, bathhouses, the Colosseum, the, the raceway, the racetrack and everything. What is that? The, um, I'll get to it, but, but all of those different cultural pursuits and things like that, those are, you know, that's the kind of thing that he was allowed to do, you know, the infrastructure kinds of things, because they had peace. So, you know, it's amazing what you don't get to build when you're at war. And when you're not at war, you can build roads and theaters and aqueducts and, and, and homes and a lot of lasting structures. And so, um, and it was during this time that the Vir Virgil wrote the Aeneid about Aeneas. Uh, mainly because Augustus thought he was descended, a descendant of Aeneas. Now, what's interesting about Aeneas, it's not the best epic poem ever written, but it's, I mean, it's meant to be like the Roman version of the Iliad and the Odyssey. And so, uh, you know, Aeneas, you know, the first few chapters of him telling a story about how he escaped from Troy while trying to make him not look like he was, you know, scared and he was running away from a battle. But his wife is killed, his dad is killed, you know, loses almost everybody, but he does band together some soldiers, they get in a boat and they get away. Um, then he also has an affair with Dido, the queen of Carthage. And in fact, it's so such a, I guess, a tempestuous affair. He, he knows he has to leave because he's destined to found Rome, but he, um, still falls in love with her and she with him and she doesn't want him to leave and she ends up committing suicide when he does leave. And so it's this tragic thing too. So it's, he has a love affair like Odysseus has several in his story in the Odyssey. And then he also visits the underworld just as Odysseus did in the Odyssey. There's, a, there's some copying going on, you know, they, he definitely, it's almost like fan fiction. If you want to think about it that way, there are some differences, of course, but um, and it's worth reading. It's just I like I like the Ill and the Odyssey better. I'm more of a purist, I guess. So, but there's still, I mean, definitely for the Romans, this was considered to be the work that united all of them around this kind of heroic ideal. You know that duty was above all. It was above love. It was more important than your personal, you know, lives. It was more important. You it, and it was worth it to suffer to serve your country. And that was much more the Roman ideal as well. So 
um, and all of the monuments that Augustus made, all of the the building, you know, it was all meant in some ways as a as a reflection on himself. Isn't he a generous benefactor? Isn't he a great Caesar? You know, doesn't he do a good job? Isn't he handsome? You know, but still, it, the benefits that came out of this are definite. So I can't blame him for being a little self centered. Um, at this time, too, Roman. You remember the the, the Greek sculpture. The Greek sculpture was all about idealism. So no one was too tall, too short, too fat, too thin. Everybody had a very, there was a very strict proportion system, mathematical proportion to follow. Same thing you would think would be from the Romans, right? Because they were learning from the Greeks. No. So while the Greeks would, were busy photoshopping themselves so that they looked ideal, Romans wanted their sculptures to look like real people. They, if it didn't look like my dad, then it wasn't done right. And so they were far more likely to represent real than ideal. They wanted it to, I mean, what's the point of having a picture of your dad if it doesn't look like him, right? So the same thing they made, they had death masks made of their, or death busts made of those who had passed away. They had they, something like this was very common where they'd have a patrician and his wife eat hand, to hand, hand in hand or something like that, um, or in some type of, of joined pose as a memorial or as a, almost like a family portrait only in, in you know, marble. But it was it, extremely common for these people to look very ordinary, um, not idealized. You know, she, for instance, in this, in this particular sculpture has a double chin and he has lines down up the side of his face and in between his eyebrows and on his forehead. And so, and she's much younger than he is, even though she's more than likely definitely his wife, but um, that's again, just, it, it reveals a little about the culture that she was much more young, much younger than, than he was. But they really wanted these, these representative sculptures to look like the person. And we're much more like this today. You know, if we see a bust of a famous celebrity or a famous, you know, athlete or something, we want to know that it looks like the person. And when it doesn't, we feel a little like, ooh, that's weird. It should look like him. Even if he's not particularly good looking, we want accuracy. Although quite a few of us still do this Photoshopping, you know, on our own photos before we put them on Facebook or Instagram. But anyway, still that, that sculpture was much, the emphasis was much more on realistic. Let's be practical, let's be realistic. Don't do the ideal. Don't, you know, that doesn't matter. Proportion, eh, who cares? And, and they're kind of gonna, going to deal with the architecture in the same way. They also developed glassware, which is really sand heated to the point that it melts. And so you can see examples, quite a few examples in the chapter, though I'm not gonna, I don't have pictures showing of them of glassware, mostly that was used by the upper class, but um, even glassware that's maybe rougher and, and not as stylized that's used by the lower classes as well in many different colors. So they used other chemicals and other minerals as they were, were um, creating the glass from the sand to make different colors and shapes and, and things like that. So from that we know from this, they may have been doing it for centuries before, but we have surviving pieces from the Roman Empire, and that's what's, I guess, important. And it really does depend on, you know, who the richer households had the nicer stuff, but there was glassware that even not so, not so rich people could afford. Okay, so it, within the Pax Romana, remember I said he could do a lot of building, and I'm, this is just a model city. This is what it would, you know, they see it as it probably would have looked like way back when. Um, it does not look like this today. So, for instance, the, um, oh, what's it called? I cannot, it's, it's slipping my mind. The, um, I will have to think of this name. The, the racetrack that you see way up in the, the upper left, this kind of long chariot racetrack, um, it, it could hold 100,000 people. But today it's just a piece of grass. You can see the shape of it, but it's, it's not, none of the seating and things like that, none of that survives today. The Colosseum, you know, survives sort of in ruined form, and we're gonna talk about more about it too. It probably would have been almost in perfect shape, except in the 13th century, a bunch of 
um, people decided, well, they were, they need to go to war and go on the crusades and things like that. And so they, they took metal braces that the Romans had put in, into the Colosseum's walls. They took them all out, melt, melt, melted them down and made weapons out of them. And not long afterwards, uh, an earthquake came in and it, you know, half of the Colosseum kind of toppled. So it wouldn't have had those braces been there, at least it might not have. You can also see an aqueduct that is coming all along the side from the left in the middle, that kind of browner sort of thing. And it's trailing water. It's actually just at a very, very slight angle, but it makes it so that gravity pulls water all the way down and into that area where there is no doubt a bathhouse where people would be using the water. But the truth is, is much of this today is in ruins. Um, it just, it, it just hasn't survived. Now, you can also see though that the vast majority of the buildings here have no domes. They're all either slightly angled roofs or they're flat. And those types of structures didn't last the way that they would if they were in do with domes. And, we'll, and I'll show you the difference when we get to the Pantheon. But this is, you know, still a pretty good idea of what it looked like. You can see the the river up in the in the upper part of the of the photograph. But this is just a model. Again, you'll notice that a lot of the buildings probably look pretty Greek to you, and that's because they were definitely following the Greek style of proportion. Although they were much bigger than the buildings would have been, companion buildings would have been over in Greece itself. So again, they were looking for size, mainly so that they could you know, accommodate lots and lots of people um, because so many more people lived in Rome than lived in any of the Greek city-states. But with Roman architecture, there were really two big things that were super important. One is that they used the Etruscan arch, modified it to a degree, but created the arch. And the arch was, and I'll explain the difference between that and the, what we had had so far. But the arch made it possible for, for concrete or stone roofs to last and to be held up, even though they were very heavy. It also made it possible to use far fewer materials when you're creating a wall. If you'll notice the aqueduct in the back of this, um, on this frame, um, this is slide 11, the aqueduct has these huge holes in it of these arches and yet it is actually a stronger wall and it takes I mean, it can take the brunt of all the water flowing through far better than if it were mostly solid and so it actually prevents being toppled over by wind because it's such a you know you have all these little holes in the wall but it also makes it so it's much easier to build you can build it much faster it's much, it's far lighter and it's more durable it's all better now, how these worked is, for instance, if it was if the water was running from one point to the other, they would start at one end of it and then they would have literally maybe a one or two degree incline down. And that was enough. Water automatically runs to the lowest point. And so they would run water sometimes 50 miles from a water source to where it, its destination was. And they could do that because it, they, they used that very slight slant. So the water didn't pool, it stayed consistently just running through like a little, they made their own little above ground went river and it worked. It, it made it so that they, with, without any machinery, they were able to have a constant source of running water. And so it's, it's really quite, you know, amazing. Now down below, you can see on the left photo, it's actually a drawing, the left plate is, a bathhouse and you can see by the size of the people down on the floor how large that building is it is gigantic how is it being held up how do how are they keeping the walls and the ceilings up these arches are doing all of the brunt work and i'll explain more of that too now the, down at the bottom is actually the it's a um a style of church or, or chapel, but it will be used, some parts of it will be used or its ideas are used in some of the later churches once Christianity begins. And that's what the thing was called. This right here, the, the long racetrack is the Circus Maximus or the large circus or the biggest circus, I should say. So, um, and then it will also, the arch will end up be, being created into a dome and that dome will effectively create the, the roof of what is the Pantheon. 
And so, yeah, this was a Constance, Constantine's Basilica is down in the far right. That's what it is. Now, the Roman arch is different. I mean, it's a, probably most of your houses in your house are not arches. They're just post and lintel with two straight, you know, side walls. And then there's a, you know, kind of a bar on top to hold it up. And that was fine, except it wasn't super strong. And that's what the, with the when you want to make really tall buildings with really enormous, you know, roofs all made out of stone, it was very hard to do that and not have the structure fall in on itself. And so what Rome did is they took the Etruscan arch and modified it somewhat. Um, they actually made it less wide and made it rounder. But what it meant is that all of the weight, instead of, you know, normally if you were looking at a post and lintel, all the weight ends up on the top, on the lintel part of it, the big bar that's crossing the top of the, the doorway. And so after a while, that weight becomes too heavy and it will make the door cave in. Roman arches or even arched ceilings where, you know, they extend it into an arched sort of tunnel. Roman arches take that weight and they distribute it automatically because it's rounded. That weight distributes to the side and down the sides instead of the center. The center is still the weakest point, but because it's of the way it's made, all that weight, instead of crushing the center, distributes down the sides. And so you can have far taller walls and ceilings, and yet the structure is so much more stable, often with thinner walls, with bigger windows, um, and, and it's, it's kind of astonishing. And yet a lot of the a lot of the buildings that were built with the arch in the first oh, five centuries of the common era are still in perfect condition. They literally have lasted up until now. They are, and they, 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 their windows may be arched, their doors may be arched. And I'll show you, this is the Pantheon that's probably the epitome of this. This is a, com, a modern day photograph of the inside of the Pantheon's arch. And the way it was built, it, it even had these, you know, these kind of little squares built into it. And yet it is still, I mean, they have, you know, of course, fixed it up at times and maintained it. And yet it is, it has been in continuous use as a temple or church since it was built over 2000 years ago. Even today, I think they hold like seven or eight um, ma public masses inside that church today because it's a Catholic church today. Um, but it's in continuous use. It's open every single day and it's open to the public. It is enormous. That's only a top view, but it's actually, I mean, it has a, it's, it's, the the bottom is still there's actually still a mosaic floor a tiled floor in the bottom and it even has a drain where the water can come through that oculus that hole in the ceiling of the dome and if it rains which it doesn't rain a lot in rome but if it rains the rain will actually drain through the drain system and this was the drain system that was built by the ancient romans so it's it's a mastery of gen, of of engineering at that time. And it's in in perfect condition today, still, even after all these years. So it's it's kind of, a, you know, it's almost a, hey, we need to use the arch more often and we need to use domes because they do, they're gonna last a lot better. It's actually pretty bright inside, even though the only window is that one at the top, that Oculus. But it's it's a it's a lovely building. It's it's one of the prettiest. If you look it up online, you can find all sorts of really lovely um a lovely examples of of some beautiful photographs in fact it's such in such a public area in old rome you can go and eat you can eat lunch outside of its building you can um there's always public musicians even today so it's still a, a definitely a center of roman life even today which is awesome in my opinion i think that's just amazing that something can last that long we also had um roman theater and i did talk to you about in the last at the last session about the fact that Romans and Greek Roman and Greek theater would be compared and that will definitely be on your test so do make sure that you pay attention and you know study you know take notes and kind of study the comparison between the two um, Roman theater was absolutely just like the Greek gods you know their their Roman gods were based on the Greek gods the Roman epic was based on the Greek epics you know a lot of Roman architecture was based on Greek architecture well 
Roman theater was definitely based on Greek theater as well. But they didn't have the religious significance that gr Greek theater did. So they didn't start as a ritual and then kind of move over. And, th and that meant they did not have a chorus. There was no chanting chorus, you know, making the actions more formal. They were probably much more like stand-up comedy today. And they liked comedy much more than they liked tragedy. The, most of the surviving plays from the Greek side were tragic. Um, they, though we do have a few that were comic. And most of the comedy in Roman theater, which was was far less epic. I mean, it, it was about ordinary people in ordinary situations, um, middle class, you know, shops and people. So and and typically and I think I'll let me see if I can. Yeah, it's not it's not shown in here. I'll switch over to the other to the chapter for a second so you can see the difference. Um, the Greek theater was was semicircular. And let me see if I can see a, an example. So it, it would have been had a crowd and maybe held about 25, 30,000 people. I'm, yes, I am skipping the Roman emperors. I don't want you to feel like you have to remember all the Roman emperors. Um, and I'll get back to that guy too. So I really don't want to skip all of this. I want, okay, so there's the outside view of the, of the, of the Pantheon. So the dome, I mean, it looks, it doesn't look, you know, it's, it's made of concrete and yet it's, it's lasted forever. It's, it, um, and there are holes in the front part and it's because that's where they held the, the placement to essentially pour the concrete in, but it's, it's quite lovely both on the inside and on the outside. Um, where is Greek theater? It's got to be somewhere. Well, I obviously need to do more work on this, but the theater was, yeah, I don't have any pictures. I need to figure, I need to get one out. Let me do that. Um, so uh, let me see if I can do that. I'll, I'll post some, I'll just post a couple of drawings of, of the theaters because they're honestly, they were a lot like the, the regular Greek theater, except and this is the big except, you know, as far as the structure is concerned, the Greek theater had one building in the back and it had one door and everybody came in and out through that door for the most part, or from the sides, you know, you know, if they were messengers running in or something. Um, but the, in, in Roman theaters, not only were they bigger, but they had the stage area had at least three doors very often. I mean, it always had a center door and then it had at least one other, you know, door up on the stage as well. Very often it had five doors and sometimes it would have five doors up on the top and then it would have exits on the side as well. So you'd have a total of seven possible entrances. But um, it was mainly because they had, instead of having one or two characters, you know, well, two to three characters max that the Greeks had on stage at any given time, they could have seven or eight characters. They didn't have this and they didn't follow the same rules. So the three unities of time and place and um, action were not necessary. I mean, Romans didn't believe too much in rules. Rules were meant to be broken. So they were much more likely to have an, a, a, a different kind of structure. They were much more likely to, to span over years. They were much more likely to have a lot of people on stage. Women were allowed on stage, though if there were any female characters who spoke, those were played by men. Women were not allowed to speak on stage. So there were still restrictions as far as that was concerned. But most of the comedies, which were far more popular with Romans, um, were stereotypical characters. Um, and, and some of them, if you want a really good version of these, there's a, a, a movie and it's also a play, but it's easy, you can find it, I think even on YouTube, you can rent it. But it's called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. And it's based on all of the Roman typical things. So in fact, they have char characters. One of the characters name is Pseudolus. And that's like, it really means fake name is what it means. But he's the character, he's the servant who's really conniving. And then Miles Gloriosus is, is the braggart soldier. And they actually have a guy whose name is Miles Gloriosus and his song, there's, it's a musical. And so he actually set, sings, I am Miles Gloriosus. And he brags about who he is. Which is, I mean, it's it's funny. It is, truly is a comedy, and it's a funny musical. It's a little goofy, but it's still funny. And 
yet it's also showing a lot of the, the aspects of Roman theater. They even have three houses in the musical and they're up on stage because this was originally staged in the theater. And one house is a house of ill repute, you know, bordello with prostitutes. One house is the main character's house with his parents. And one house is this is, is shared by an old man and they're all living on the same street. That was very typical structure for a play is that there would be either three shops uh, on a on a, a commercial street or be three people's houses or be something like that. And a lot of these stereotypical characters are used. And the main thing is, is let's have a good time and let's make some jokes and have funny things happen. So a lot of body comedy, a lot of, you know, sixth grade comedy, you know, with with jokes about people being ugly and and, you know, passing gas and stuff. I mean, just goofy jokes, nothing, nothing highbrow at all. <laughs> it's meant to be just silly, you know, and, and mistaken identities and all that kind of stuff. So um, the truth is, is, is Roman theater was, you know, people went there to have fun. They did not go there to, to go through any serious tragedy and to come out feeling, you know, sobbing or anything. They wanted happy kinds of things, you know. Um, Americans are, I think we're, we, we tend to like happier movies more than the sad, tragic stuff anyway. Um, probably the, the most excessive of, you know, the big, you know, the biggest that they went, the Romans did, is in the Colosseum itself, though. The Colosseum is in ruins today. You can't, you can tour parts of it, though you have to have a guided tour. You can't get in without a guided tour. Um, but it originally had a hydraulic, several hy hydraulic lifts in the floor. So the floor was wood at that time, and it originally housed about 50,000 people. The only time it didn't is when they would fill it with water and have sea battles in it. Then you could only fill the top rows because of the water in, inside the Colosseum. And it, of course, they'd pump it in through hydraulic pumps. But they did have gladiators who would fight to the death. They did have Jews and Christians really fed to lions. They did. I mean, it was a violent, very realistic. I mean, they, they wanted realism. They wanted real stuff, not fake stuff. So even the, the theater, even though it was a lot more violent and a lot more you know down to earth than Greek theater had been, it was nothing compared to what happened in the Colosseum. And it definitely paled in comparison because this was these were real people in real battles really dying. All that stuff really did happen. It's not just made up and put in what Gladiator and other movies like that. It really did happen. The, the, these people really, lots of people really did die in the Colosseum. And then, of course, it eventually went and fell into ruins once the earthquake happened about, a, I don't know, well over a thousand years after it was built. But it's still, I mean, it's still in pretty cool condition. And you can see even here how much the arch is utilized inside the structure. Although, remember with the Greeks, they had the three different orders of, of architecture, the Ionic, the Doric, and the Corinthian. Well, the Roman Colosseum, if you go to visit it, it uses all three orders at once, which was for the Greeks an absolute no-no. Like you can only use one, just one on each building, but no, they decided they'd put all three in there. So it's amazing how, how much changes. Now, as far as the Roman philosophy, they were again practical. It's all about practical. Their most, probably their most, um, the the at least the philosophy that they most adhered to, especially amongst the Roman army, around the Senate, and those who governed, was Stoicism. And you know, I used to say, well, Stoicism means you know, life sucks and and then you die, but just deal with it. You know, it's it's about not taking your own sorrows too seriously. Of course, life is hard. Of course, you're going to suffer. Of course, you know, you might be starving, but what matters is what you do. And that means you don't whine and cry about it. You go and do, you do put in work, you put in effort, you, you always act with justice. You always treat the world with temperance. You don't overindulge in drink or food or um, ex an excess of violence. Everything is is tempered. You take the world without too much emotional reaction, and it's more. It, it really fed into the idea that the the empire was more important than the individual, 
which is something that's, you know, for a lot of people, that's, you know, that you, it's, I mean, you think about any of the armed forces, how much they sacrifice for the greater good of the country. That's very much a part of, that's probably why it was such a part of the Roman military, the Roman military at that time. Um, with, they also had an opposite side though, and this is probably where all the, the comedies fed into and things like that, is that life shouldn't just be pain. You should, seek pleasure and but not to the point of causing yourself pain so it's fine to go and drink it's not fine to get drunk and get sick and then have a headache the next day that's stupid or do violence because you got too drunk or do other bad things you know that's not okay everything should be in moderation enjoy a good meal but don't eat too much and become a glutton or make yourself sick you know so it's again moderation. That's it, it's more it's it's about enjoying the smaller moments and not making them huge and big, but not letting you know smelling the flowers as you're walking by them. Don't just ignore the fact that they're existing, but they're still pretty practical. You know this is how we how do you deal with your daily life in a way that's both productive and yet enjoyable. As far as a religion, we talked a little bit about some of those. Um, I can give you a list if you want, but I'm not going to test you on it. That has like, you know, here's the Greek God and here's the equivalent Roman God and back and forth. I'm not going to ask you that. But it's it's probably if you're interested in any of that, it's probably good to know which was which. Some of the sources that we have for Greek mythology are actually from Roman sources. And same with the art. Romans copied a lot of stuff from the Greeks into um, into stone. But the Greeks made them original. The original Greek stuff was all in um, bronze, which most of it got melted down when it was, you know, time to go to war or something like that. So it's good that the Romans copied all of it. But we will get to some literature beyond um, Virgil. Ovid's Metamorphoses and Amores and several of his other books are actually all about mythology. He names them all by the Roman names, all the Roman gods. And yet they're they they stem from Greek mytholo mythological sources, and so that's he recorded a bunch of different stories that we still know know of today, as also representatives of Greek mythology. They, he just changed all the names. That's all. So if you ever wonder about any of that, or you want any resources, or you love Greek mythology, I have a bunch of stuff you could borrow if you're interested in that. That could be something too that you could look at that mythology versus something else. Um, when you're comparing, doing a comparative essay. So think about it. If you're, if it, think of what you're into at this point, because that's going to be what you want to write about. Is you know what have you found an interest in? What has kind of piqued your interest most? Then we can all help you find an equivalent era, something that you can compare it to. Now, for the most part, the Roman Empire was pretty peaceful, with the exception of one area, and that's one that's going to figure in Christianity as to, as well, and that's that's Judea. Um, that that area, the Jewish population did not want to be ruled by Rome, and so they, they were. That area was characterized by a lot of violence, a lot of protests, a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, a lot of those things were going on. So it was it, the Roman army had a constant presence there because they were trying to quell the rioting and the protests, and that's actually going to affect the development of Christianity and the origins of Christianity, because it will affect Jesus, um, essentially the, the main founder of Christianity. And it will affect um, Paul, uh, well, Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, um, who was considered the, kind of the co-founder because he spread Christianity around much of the Mediterranean. But um, these revolts are also, it's another place, um, another later place is the exception, and that's up in um, Great Britain. In England, none of the English, none of the, the you know, the Celts, none of the, those, the populations in Britain wanted to be part of the Roman Empire. And so over many centuries, they refused to give tribute and refuse, you know, anytime they'd, they'd not send tribute, the Roman army would trek all the way up to the Northern Europe and try to face them and then they'd be quelled and then they still wouldn't send tribute and nothing would happen. I mean, it was, it was kind of funny. Um, but it's, it, the truth is, is that resistance would eventually contribute to the fall of the Roman Empire. 
because once you had outside resistance, you know, from actual invading tribes, it became almost impossible to govern the entire empire. You didn't have the military to manage all of the different riots or all of the protests or all of the invading armies. And it's just, it's, it was more than the, the military could keep, continue to handle um, given their resources. And so that will be one of the contributions to that destruction. Now you can see, I do have one, and this is more for your fun than anything else. You'll probably, again, recognize the, the right side. Although at the bottom, you'll notice that, you know, like Hercules, we know that name pretty well, you know, super strong dude, the 12 labors of Hercules. Well, I mean, it really was the 12 labors of Heracles, but we know the Roman name far better. Um, and the same thing goes with Odysseus. A lot of people know Ulysses far better. And there are even poems and books written in the last oh, 100 years or so that were written with Ulysses as the main name. Poems, there's a poem, Ulysses, and then there's a, a book by an Irish author, actually, called Ulysses. And it's still about Odysseus, but we just know the Roman roots better. So probably because so much of what we did stemmed from the Roman beginnings. And they kind of superimposed themselves over the Greek ones. So if you're more of a Greek purist like me, though, it's it's fine that that, you know, that you like that instead. Now, as far as writing, I did tell you already there was a lot of history. The truth is, is Roman writing did have poetry and yet it was and, and it, of course, had an epic, you know, the, the Aeneid and yet the vast majority of, of writing at this time was history. It was practical. It was about how to, you know, be a good orator, how to get well, in, you know, get go up, you know, swiftly in the government, how to win friends and influence people, you know, it was more like that kind of stuff. It was much more about and a lot of lesson books survive. There were books on architecture. Uh, that were commonly written. There were books on music that kind of described what music should be and how it worked and things like that. So a lot of it was very much nonfiction. We do have a few, again, like Aeneas and the Aeneid. We do have Ovid's Metamorphoses and Amores, but the truth is Ovid's works, although people read them a lot today because they're just fun stories, a lot of people at the time saw them as essentially pornographic and they they said that the stuff was was bad. It was bad writing, bad literature. It would corrupt youth, you know, stuff like that. Um, it was much too salacious to read. And so um, the people at that time did not look at that as like good literature. It was, you know, kind of the smut or something of that that age. They much preferred the, the more practical texts on um, oratory on public speaking on you know government and things like that so it's just weird how things change you know today of course we do have a lot of nonfiction, but people really go for the fiction a lot of times um, as far as other gods your chapter covers a lot of different ones and i i guess mostly i just want you to be aware that these all had influence over different parts of the empire because again just like i said at the beginning the emperor, they allowed people to worship whatever they wanted. They didn't have to, they weren't forced to worship Roman gods or do anything specific as far as that. They could worship their own. And um, there were quite a few different ones that would eventually have quite an effect on Christianity and some of the other faiths. So I wanted to bring up a few. Um, one is the cult of Isis. That was very common throughout Rome, um, the Roman Empire. And though Isis was a an Egyptian goddess, she's the the goddess. Actually, she was married to Osiris, and um, she saved Osiris when his brother Set killed him. Which again feels like Cain and Abel to me. But she uh, Set actually killed him and then cut him up into pieces and strewed his bodies all over Egypt. And she ran around and found all the pieces and um, put him back together. But the cult of Isis, Isis was always seen as a very benevolent figure. And so people would pray to her as someone who would actually listen and help them, who was who was compassionate and caring, and like a mother figure. And a lot of people see her, her role being taken over by the Virgin Mary once Catholicism is established, once the Christianity is established. 
um, Mary becomes that figure of supplication where people are afraid to go to the, you know, Jesus or to Jehovah, but they're, they're willing to talk to Mary about it because she's more motherly and she's more likely to be merciful. Um, so they see that kind of in the origins and we'll talk more about Mary later, but then Mithras um, was a fascinating figure. We don't know much. I mean, we don't even know if he actually existed, but we know there was a cult of Mithra. Um, and the, the cult had, they actually used, we know they used baptism, which was a very unusual rite at this time. They did have hold communion and they believed in that, that Mithra was resurrected. And they also believe that his birthday, they celebrated his birthday as December 25th. And so it's in some ways, it was a very common cult at the time of the beginnings of Christianity. And so a lot of paleontologists and a lot of historians believe that there was a, a link, not only with the cults of Isis and Mithras, but other secret cults like this, where there were elements of it that ended up being adopted by Christianity because for many years, Christianity was deemed to be a cult. Um, people who, were, who worship Christianity would end up well, essentially they had to remain hidden and hide their status to their friends and and neighbors and so because all these other cults were also secret cults they were it was following in the footsteps and following some of the same patterns and um so it's that's just again we don't know exactly why certain things came about within christianity and so these are links that kind of give us an indication of where some of these things came from and then, of course, we had monotheism. We're going to talk much more about Judaism um, in the next, in chapter four, in the next unit. But from for a long time, Judaism and well, ancient Hebrews were far different from um, they were, the, the, their monotheism was radically different from the typical polytheism. And so, and they also often had a lot of unrest between themselves and other groups that were polytheistic. And that's even recorded in their um, religious texts and their historical texts, which many of which are, have become part of the Old Testament of the Christian Bible. But they were really only, they were extremely small percentage of the Roman population, most of them centered in Judea, and yet they were wildly unpopular with the rest of the Roman Empire, mostly because of, you know, they were they were highly resistant. They didn't want to be part of the empire. And so those uprisings were a, a sore spot for the government, but they were also deemed by the rest of the group, you know, well, because the vast majority of the rest of the empire was polytheistic. They were seen as kind of like that little like redheaded stepchild or something. And so um, they were not viewed with favor in general. Now, Judaism, well, not really Judaism, but Christianity would end up becoming one of the factors to the fall of the Roman Empire um, eventually. Much of it, though, I mean, we can certainly look at, I've already mentioned the fact that the land mass was now huge and really unprotectable. You can't, you can protect Rome really easy. You can't necessarily protect all of the empire. And um, having a divided Roman army, which happened towards the end of the Roman Empire, more and more of the army um, would have friction with the emperor at the time. And so a lot of emperors were assassinated, replaced, and then two or three years later were assassinated against again. And so I think in one span of like 35 years, they went through like 28 different emperors. Literally, they kept getting assassinated, assassinated, assassinated. And that division makes it so that, I mean, how do you have it, run a government when people are constantly getting assassinated? And the answer is you don't. And so more and more that division was causing a problem. But there was also, I mean, like the Rome itself, because they were the governing body, was taking more and more of the wealth and get, distributing far less of it and far less defense to the rest of its realm. And so that was creating division. There were a series of droughts and crop failures and that added, you know, again, people were starving. So that added to, more, you know, more unrest. Even Christianity, to, to a degree, people believe um, had some effect, mainly because once Christianity was adopted, Christianity in general was a very non-violent, you know, they, they believed violence was wrong. And so it, it certainly changed the, the view for a lot of people of the army 
and of war and things like that. And it, it probably more than more than likely it weakened the army because of that, because so many people believe that war just simply shouldn't happen. Now, the Christians will change their mind later on when we get to the Crusades, but for now they were they were trying to be nonviolent. Um, but the truth is, there was a lot of corruption and, and there was a lot of dissension. And after a while, all of these tr Germanic tribes, I, I say the word Germanic because they spoke Germanic languages. OK, so the Roman Empire, you know, again, they were supposed to speak Latin, at least the government did. The Germanic tribes spoke German and Finnish and and Norwegian and a lot of other far more ancient languages that we don't even have anymore. But they were nomadic. They were wandering tribes. And so and they were also very militaristic. You know, they they would fight and raid and do all sorts of things, just like Vikings did, you know. And so they would raid parts of the, the empire and the empire was just too big to protect. And so the raids, they would actually gain territory. Eventually, the Germanic tribes would come all the way to Rome and Rome would fall in 1450, I mean, in, in 476. Now, at that time, once the German, the Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire and became Christian, it actually split up into two pieces. The Western Roman Empire centered in Rome and the Eastern Roman Empire centered in Constantinople. Constantinople and the Eastern Empire would not fall for another thousand years. So it survived until 1453. But the Western Empire fell in 476. And it fell because the Germanic tribes actually came into Rome itself and toppled the government. So that was the, I mean, it was a pretty dramatic end to the Roman Empire. Now, would, it, would Latin still survive to a degree? I mean, people say it's a, a it, people say it's an actually, a, um, what is the, what am I, what's the word I mean? I'm looking for, I lost my train of thought. But um, the, they, oh, they call Latin a dead, a dead language. Well, it's, it's not. And I'll explain more as we get there, but Latin actually is a language that turned into many other languages. So it turned into, you know, in Spain, it turned into Spanish. In Portugal, it turned into Portuguese, which is, it sounds, Portuguese sounds like a mixture between French and Spanish. In Italy, it became Italian. It, it, language changes over time, as we're going to see even with English. But in Romania, it became Romanian. In French, France, it became fr French. And so every place it went, it, those populations, especially if they set, stayed still, you know, stayed where they were, they just, their language just changed. And after a while, it changed a lot. And so suddenly it became different languages. So Latin technically survives. It's just not, it doesn't survive as this purified Latin of the classical era in Roman, of the Roman Empire or in the Latin texts that the churches will adopt. It just doesn't survive like that anymore. Nobody speaks Latin as a baby and is raised speaking Latin, if that makes sense. Anyway, if you have questions, that's pretty much the rest of, of what's going on. It takes you all the way through the fall. We will, this will finish up the unit. And so once you finish up chapters, you know, the unit, the, the journal on chapter three and the discussions on chapter three next, you know, that will be due um, in the coming week, though, you need to make sure once those are all done, the test will open and then make sure and complete that test. So this will wrap it all up though. So you'll have, you essentially have three chapters, one, two, and three that will be on that test. The test is not gonna be open book. Um, I will have a camera that you'll need to have a camera set up with you, you know, but, but you should be able to manage all of that, I hope. If you do have questions, let me know and I will answer them as best as I can. Thanks.